Greetings, dear subscribers and casual listeners of my channel. So, we return to the secrets of Harry Potter section, where we share fascinating facts left out of the films with our special fifth episode. Our regular viewers already know where Dudley's pigtail went, how Aragog's terrifying offspring came to populate the Forbidden Forest, who was the secret benefactor of the Weasley twins, and much more. Today we'll discuss how Dumbledore's army mirrored the Death Eaters, whom Voldemort killed at the beginning of The Goblet of Fire, how Bill Weasley and Fleur Delacour met, and why wizards don't always use spoken spells. Enjoy the video. Number 1. Hermione's Dark Mark. Voldemort is back. War is brewing. And in response, the Ministry decides that teaching students to fight is not the best idea and sends Dolores Umbridge to Hogwarts as the Defence Against the Dark Arts instructor. Harry Potter disagrees with Umbridge's theory-based teaching methods and organises a self-defence club with his friends. Dumbledore's army included dozens of students from all years and houses, except, of course, Slytherin. But how could such a large group meet in secret? Hermione, inspired by Tom Riddle's Dark Mark, which all Death Eaters could feel, created Dark Marks for each member of Dumbledore's army. Hermione soon devised a clever way to notify everyone of meeting times and dates when sudden changes were needed. Gathering too often in the Great Hall would look suspicious, so Hermione gave each member a fake galleon. Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix Unlike the Dark Lord, she didn't mark the student's skin. Instead, she enchanted fake galleons, magical coins, to heat up when Harry set a meeting. See the numbers along the edge, she said, showing a sample at the end of the fourth lesson. The coin shone golden in the torchlight. On real galleons, that's the serial number indicating which goblin cast it. On these fake ones, the numbers change to show the date and time of the next meeting. When the date changes, the coin heats up, so if you keep it in your pocket, you'll feel it. Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix Luckily, only Harry thought of the Dark Mark comparison. Otherwise, some DA members might have hesitated at resembling Death Eaters in any way. Harry turned to her. You know what this reminds me of? No, what? The Death Eater's scars. Voldemort touches one, and they all feel it burning. It signals he's summoning them. Well, yes, Hermione said softly. That's what gave me the idea. But note, I decided to put the date on metal objects, not on anyone's skin. Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Number 2. The Killer Gardener. The fourth movie starts rather strangely for the unprepared viewer, leading one to wonder if it's really Harry Potter. Why are we shown an old man in an ancient house? But everything falls into place when Wormtail and the Dark Lord appear. So what was this place Voldemort chose for his hideout, and who was that old man? In Little Hangleton it's still called the Riddle House, although the Riddle family hasn't lived there for a long time. Voldemort's father is buried here, from whose grave Wormtail took his bone. The old man who tended the house for years was Frank Bryce, who had been accused of murdering Tom Riddle Sr. and his parents, but was released due to a lack of evidence. Tom Riddle himself killed his muggle father, grandfather and grandmother when he was just sixteen. Just as things were getting bad for Frank, an autopsy report was received, turning the case around. The police had never seen a stranger conclusion. Doctors examining the bodies came to a startling finding. None of the riddles had been poisoned, stabbed, shot, strangled, suffocated by gas, or sustained any injuries. In fact, they all seemed in perfect health, except for the detail that they were dead. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire Since there was no evidence the riddles were murdered at all, Frank was released and continued tending the garden until his death at the hands of the Dark Lord at the age of seventy-six. Number 3. An Office Romance 
In the seventh movie, Fleur Delacour unexpectedly returns, now revealed as Bill Weasley's fiancé. It's a shame this relationship developed off-screen, but it's even more confusing that this scene is the first introduction of Bill. So, how did the French witch and one of the eldest Weasley siblings meet? In Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, before the third task of the Triwizard Tournament, champions were allowed to meet their families. Harry, told he had visitors, rushed to meet them, wondering why the Dursleys had come only to be surprised by Mrs. Weasley and Bill. This was the first time Fleur noticed her future husband. Harry noticed that Fleur Delacour was looking at Bill over his mother's shoulder with considerable interest. She clearly didn't mind the long hair or the fang earring. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire By the sixth book, Fleur is engaged to Bill and moves into the burrow, which wasn't shown in the movie. Bill had worked as a curse breaker for the Gringotts branch in Egypt. This is also why, after winning a lottery, the prisoner of Azkaban, the Weasleys travelled to Egypt. After Voldemort's return, Bill joined the Order of the Phoenix and transferred to the London branch of the bank, where Fleur also started working part-time after graduating from Beaubaton. Bill is very busy now, he has a lot of work, and I work at Gringotts part-time to perfect my English, so he brought me here for a few days to meet his family. I was so glad to know you'd be here. There's nothing to do here, only cooking and chickens. Well, bon appétit, Harry. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Interestingly, Mrs. Weasley wasn't immediately accepting of her son's choice, finding it a bit hasty. Only a year later, when Bill was injured by Fenrir Greyback, did she realise their love was genuine. Number 4. The Silent Wizards As you may have noticed, in the early movies, casting spells required saying the words correctly, and in some cases performing specific wand movements. These were the basics. However, with each new film, more wizards began ignoring previously established rules, performing magic without verbalizing the spells. This wasn't just a cinematic choice to avoid chaotic spell battles, but a magical skill known as non-verbal spells. Characters, along with readers, first learned about it in the sixth book during a lesson from Severus Snape. I assume you are completely unfamiliar with non-verbal spells, what is the advantage of nonverbal spells? Hermione's hand shot up. Snape surveyed the class slowly, realising he had no choice, and curtly said, Very well, Miss Granger. The opponent doesn't know in advance which spell you're about to cast, Hermione said. It gives you a tiny advantage in time. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince However, Snape also noted that mastering this skill is difficult, and not everyone can achieve it. Indeed, those who master the ability to cast spells without shouting the incantations gain a time advantage and can catch an opponent off guard. However, not all wizards are capable of this. It requires strong focus and mental discipline, qualities that... His hateful gaze settled on Harry again. Not everyone possesses. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince Number 5. The Backstory of the Marauders The Marauders' backstory is one of the most intriguing and essential elements in the Harry Potter world, yet it's almost entirely missing from the films. The Marauders, James Potter, Sirius Black, Remus Lupin and Peter Pettigrew, were friends who left secret traces behind at Hogwarts. They created the Marauders' map, an invaluable tool that later helped Harry in his own adventures. But it's not just about the map. The Marauder's story holds the key to understanding their relationships and secrets, especially those tied to Harry's past. The Marauders weren't just friends. They lived for their friendship. Lupin, for instance, was a werewolf, which usually meant isolation and fear. But James, Sirius and Peter became Animagi, learning to transform into animals, to be with Lupin, help him, and keep him safe. These moments reveal the risk, trust, and how Harry inherited his father's ideals of friendship 
and loyalty. In Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, Harry learns about his father's friendship with the Marauders, but the movie only gives us a glimpse of who they were. Filming scenes like these is a challenge. It would require additional actors for young versions of James, Sirius, Remus and Peter, consuming time and budget and potentially detracting from Harry's story. This storyline would take up too much space, commented one of the screenwriters. To portray the Marauders' backstory, they would need lengthy dialogues and explanations. They would need to convey to viewers all the emotions and pain in that friendship, which would take time the film didn't have. The movie could lose its pace and the audience might lose focus on Harry. For those who haven't read the books, it would feel like an unnecessary detour, shared one of the producers. It was a tough decision, but the filmmakers opted to keep it subtle. In The Prisoner of Azkaban, it's mentioned that the Marauder's map was created by four friends, but there are almost no details about them. Harry only hears snippets of conversations, and we understand that these friends shared something special, but exactly what remains a mystery. As a result, we only catch faint hints of the friendship between Sirius and Lupin, without seeing its full depth. Moments when they remember James are barely noticeable. Lupin talks about how his friends supported him, but without details, hiding the full pain and camaraderie they shared in their youth. Number 6. The Quidditch World Cup In the book, the Quidditch World Cup is a full celebration. Harry, Ron and Hermione attend the Magical World's main sporting event, where excitement abounds and the stands roar with cheers. But it's more than just a match. The World Cup final between Ireland and Bulgaria showcases the magic of Quidditch in all its power. The players seem to fly effortlessly, the stands erupt with energy, and Bulgaria's star, Victor Crum, wows everyone by catching the snitch, even though he loses the game. This scene captures the passion of the magical world. In the movie, however, the World Cup only flashes by. We see the roaring stands and wizards in colourful attire setting up the audience for a magical match but instead we're immediately transported to events after the game. The thrilling climax where Crumb catches the snitch is left off screen. Filming the World Cup scene was costly and complicated. Each Quidditch match requires massive production costs. And here it was a whole stadium, thousands of spectators, complex aerial stunts. They needed to show not just a game, but also the national pride behind it. For that time, such special effects were too labour-intensive. Another reason the World Cup scene was cut was focus. In the book, it conveys the magical world's atmosphere and introduces us to Crumb, but the primary storyline is the Triwizard Tournament. Keeping the focus on that allowed the filmmakers to avoid distractions and dedicate more time to Harry's journey and the tournament's challenges. Number 7. The Society for the Promotion of Elfish Welfare, S.P.E.W. In the books, Hermione founded the Society for the Promotion of Elfish Welfare, S.P.E.W., to protect house elves. After seeing them work in Hogwarts' kitchen, she was appalled by their servitude, hidden from view and without freedom. Hermione decided this was unacceptable. She handed out badges, advocated for house elf rights, and even refused to eat the food they prepared. Harry and Ron were sceptical of her cause, thinking house elves were happy and didn't even want freedom, but Hermione believed they simply didn't know any other life. This storyline was left out of the movies. Dobby remained, but the audience never saw other house elves. It would have been too expensive to show scenes in the kitchen with numerous house elves, requiring complex CGI effects. Each house elf would be a character created from scratch, which would take considerable resources. Additionally, Hermione's activism didn't impact the main plot. SPEW reflects her character, her drive for justice, but it wouldn't have affected Harry's trials. 
For viewers who hadn't read the books, it would be unclear why so much attention was given to house elf issues while Voldemort's threat loomed over their world. Book fans, of course, missed this part. SPEW shows Hermione as a justice fighter, even willing to face misunderstanding from her closest friends. No one wants freedom if they don't know it exists, she tells her friends about the house elves. It's an important facet of her character that was left out of the films to maintain the main story's focus. Leaving out SPEW freed up time and kept the film's pace. In the books, this storyline is short, but its portrayal in the film would have required numerous scenes. These details enriched Hermione's character, but they ran the risk of slowing down the plot too much. Number 8. Harry's rage after Sirius's death. Sirius's death in the books hits Harry hard, ripping away his last link to family. Sirius was his hope for a home and love, and losing him wounded Harry deeply. He was furious unable to accept the injustice. In Dumbledore's office, he smashes everything he can reach. Pain, anger and despair blend into this moment. It's not just a burst of anger, it's a soul-crushing scream. Why did he have to go? Harry cries, unable to believe fate's cruelty. His hands tremble and he lashes out. His rage is so intense that words can't fully express the pain, only his actions do. In this scene, Harry isn't just a teenager, he's a boy devastated by a loss he can't comprehend. This scene was omitted in the film. Conveying such an emotional storm on screen is challenging. In the books, readers can see what's happening in Harry's mind, but the film lacks an inner monologue, showing only actions. Portraying it as a simple outburst of anger would have been risky, as Harry might appear as a teenager losing control rather than a hero crushed by grief. The filmmakers decided that the scene could distract from the main plot. They focused on Harry's future battles and his fight against Voldemort. Sirius's loss is still significant, but they chose to show it in a more restrained way without Harry's destructive anger. Including the rage scene could have changed how viewers saw Harry. In the book, he's wounded and human, but in the film, without his thoughts, he might come across as overly impulsive. The creators understood that leaving the scene might make viewers see not pain, but just a sudden burst of anger. Number 9. The Memories of the Horcruxes In the books, Dumbledore shows Harry memories of the creation of Horcruxes, plunging him into Voldemort's dark past. It's more than just lessons. Harry sees Tom Riddle transform into a ruthless dark wizard. These scenes reveal Voldemort's weaknesses, fears, and obsession with eternal life. Through them, Harry begins to understand that his enemy isn't just a villain, but a man with a broken past. One of the most chilling memories is Tom Riddle's meeting with Hepzibah Smith, where he sees Hufflepuff's cup and Slytherin's locket, which he later turns into Horcruxes. Harry realises that Voldemort sought powerful artefacts for a reason. Each one symbolised his drive for immortality, giving depth to his motivation and making his character terrifyingly realistic. But in the movie, almost all of these scenes were cut. Too many memories could overload the plot and drag the film. Each memory required special effects, new sets and characters. Constant time jumps could confuse viewers, pulling them away from the main storyline. Instead, the filmmakers chose only the most crucial memory. Viewers see young Tom Riddle asking Professor Slughorn about Horcruxes, a moment that shows his hunger for power. They didn't show the entire backstory, but focused on key moments, leaving the rest behind the scenes. This was a bold choice. In the book, Dumbledore guides Harry along Voldemort's trail like a detective, but the film needed to keep pace, focusing on the present. The creators wanted to speed up the story and maintain the tension without drawing the viewer into lengthy flashbacks. Number 10. Harry goes into the forest alone. In the book, when Harry walks into the forbidden forest, he knows he is going to die. It's his final silent farewell to life. 
he understands that he must sacrifice himself to defeat Voldemort, and he goes alone. This journey is his personal battle. Every step is a struggle, but he doesn't stop. All we feel is his fear, resolve, and quiet sorrow. On his way, Harry thinks of his friends, about what will happen when he is gone. We read his thoughts, his fear of death, and understand that this is his final moment. He is alone, but prepared to face death by himself. In this scene, Harry is not a hero. He's a boy who has to die to save everyone. In the film, this scene was changed. The cinematic format doesn't allow us to experience Harry's thoughts the way the book does, so the filmmakers added a farewell with Hermione and Ron. He explains to them that he has to go. This adds drama that viewers can understand and feel, but it's not the same silent farewell as in the book. Saying goodbye to his friends amplifies Harry's heroism. He explains, says his goodbyes, and steps toward his fate. This moment is emotional, but loses the quiet solitude found in the book. In the movie, the scene is louder, more dramatic, whereas the book conveys it more intimately, deeply, in complete silence. Number 11. The Final Battle In the book, the final battle between Harry and Voldemort happens in front of everyone. They stand in the Great Hall, surrounded by students and teachers. Harry exposes Voldemort's weaknesses, speaking of his mistakes and the strength he never understood, love and sacrifice. Voldemort begins to lose confidence, and everyone around sees his fear and vulnerability. It's not just a duel, it's a moment of truth. In the book, Harry fights not only with spells, but also with words, showing Voldemort that he's already lost. Voldemort's power is built on arrogance and fear, and now Harry strips him of that power. It's a duel not just of strength, but of ideals, with Harry's words as his greatest weapon. The movie portrays the scene differently. The battle takes place in isolation, with no onlookers, just Harry and Voldemort one-on-one. -on -one. It's pure action, spells, struggle, intense stares. The scene emphasizes raw emotional conflict, with words taking a back seat to the energy of the duel. This choice was intentional. In the book, Harry can articulate his position, but in the film, this could have prolonged the climax. Maintaining the film's pace was crucial, so the filmmakers opted for action without words, keeping the scene intense and swift. Viewers are fully immersed in the tension of the fight. That's all. Thank you for watching until the end. I hope this means you found it interesting, and if so, don't forget to like, share your thoughts in the comments, and subscribe to the channel.